All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Will Barron, who is, as I love to say here, across the pond in the UK, up in the, uh, up in the Leeds area. How are you doing, Will? I'm doing very well. Have you ever done an intro, John, where it hasn't been sunny? Um, yes, actually, uh, <laughs> I have to say we've had, this is, people don't believe me, but the last two years, we've got lovely sunshine now, but the last two years in San Diego, the weather has not been good. It has been very overcast, cloudy, cold even. Um, however, nobody gives me any sympathy when I complain about the uh, San Diego weather. <laughs> not, not when I'm sat in Leeds in the, the north of the UK, you get no sympathy. For, sympathy exactly. And not from my, uh, from my family back home in Ireland who, uh, you know, who love to tell, you know, who get the summer rain and winter rain in the middle of summer and all that good stuff. So um, Will is the founder of salesman.com and is on a mission to make selling simple. Your recent book, Selling Made Simple, is the result of nine years of research, 1,000 plus podcast interview, and 20,000 plus sellers completing the sales code assessment, and 2,300 plus students having massive success inside the Salesman Academy. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how can you find and close more deals in 2004 using a series of proven selling frameworks. So um, first of all, Will, tell us, this is fascinating. Tell me about your journey, your nine-year journey to create this book and the Salesman Academy, because it's a very, uh, very impressive. So I started off in medical device sales, selling, um, well, I'll take a step back. That might be useful for the audience uh, as we're, we're talking pure sales here. I started off doing a chemistry, chemistry degree, then moving into chemical catalyst sales. That lasted two months before I got fired. <laughs> just straight fired, no, no, no faffing around, no probation, <laughs> no p performance improvement plan, just got sacked. Um, and I, I guess I'm starting with the, the, the tale with that because I don't think most people are born salespeople. I think that you learn the skills and attributes uh, to, to become a great salesperson. So from there, I went into medical device sales, selling um, endoscopic camera systems to surgeons all around the UK. Started at the South UK, moved to the biggest competitor of that organization up in the North UK. And I came home one day, this is when I lived in Leeds, when I first moved up here, and I very literally Googled how to get better at sales. That that literal key phrase right there. And unfortunately, all of the content was dudes in ill-fitting suits and women in with suits with shoulder pads from the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. And none of it was appropriate. None of it was acceptable. None of it right. would fly with the surgeons that I was selling to. Right. There was no way you could use those tactics of, of manipulation, they might call it a tool of influence, but essentially mm -hmm. a tactic of ma manipulation with the surgeons that I was engaging with because I'll, you know, being conscious of my language, but they, they tell you to get stuffed and you wouldn't be allowed back in that operating room again. Yep. And that's when I started the podcast. I started interviewing sales experts primarily at first, trying to uncover what works, what doesn't, and trying to get the, the nuanced uh, kind of the, the nuances of sales documented. Then it turned into step-by-step -step processes and frameworks, and that's really what I like to ask questions about. And then I got sick and tired of interviewing so-called sales experts and moved into interviewing Olympic athletes, uh, UFC fighters, uh, special forces snipers, uh, interviewed in astronauts, all kinds of crazy individuals, high performers, to yeah. try and uncover what they were doing and their processes and if that could translate to us, us humble sales professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, at some point down the line, people started asking me for training. So that's where that came from. Uh, but yeah, prim primarily, I was trying to you know, scratch my own so itch. What, yeah. So what, 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 what were some of the things that really surprised you early on when you started doing this research? Something that surprised me immediately when I started interviewing people outside of the sales space was that they all had a process. And the process was as refined and as proven as it could possibly be. I interviewed, I interviewed an astronaut called Scott, and I said, I literally asked him, that you are sat on top of a giant can of rocket fuel that an explosion is going to come out of one end, and it's going to fire you away from the planet that you've spent, you know, hundreds, yeah. thousands and thousands of generations of your, your family have evolved over time to become, to become adapt to live on this planet. How do you deal with the stress and the panic and the pressure of that? And in the context of a lot of salespeople are nervous to pick up the phone and, and do a cold call. 
And he was like, yeah, I would be nervous to do a cold call as well. I'm not nervous to be on a rocket being launched into outer space because I've got a team behind me and there's a process that we're all following. And as long as the process is followed, nine to nine, nine, 99 times out of 100, we're going to be okay. And so that was a bit of an aha moment for me of, well, what can we build process-wise for salespeople so that it might not get them to absolutely elite in sales? Because that then is a bunch of re- coaching mm-hmm. and, and refinement and understanding how things work for your specific industry and your specific customers. But how can we build a process that gets people 80% of the way there so mm-hmm. that they're hitting quota, they're making good money, and then you know they've got the cash and resources to invest into themselves as any professional would. Yeah. So that's when we started writing out the book and, and drilling into the content and, and really trying to build you know, a series of frameworks to help us uh, you know, succeed. Yeah, because what I like about that is, uh, Will, is that uh, we know process is important and every company has a sales process in some fashion or another. However, there's still uh, there's still an element in sales that kind of is like, mm, you don't want to really get tied down by process or process is there as a guide. It's not really there as something I have to follow because, you know, I have my own way of doing things. But st- but by research they've proven that statistically the highest performing organizations in sales are the ones that have a a a defined sales process that is mandatory that has steps within it and that it and it's followed very closely um so tell me a little bit about the the start telling me about the process that you developed or the step-by-step framework that you developed so there are there are 15 frameworks we we can dive into a couple if you like or we can keep it high level but the initial one is building a value proposition. So mm. almost, it's crazy, it's crazy. Almost every single salesperson I speak to, they cannot share with me the value of their product to their customers in a single sentence. They can tell me what it is over eight sentences. They can share what it is with a, a slide deck and a diagram and a, and a video that marketing has produced, but they can't share with me in, and this is, the, this is how we reverse engineer the, and build these frameworks. They can't share it with me in a structure that would go something like, I help this person solve this problem in this way. And hopefully this way is somewhat unique, novel, interesting. Mm -hmm. That's how you're going to get attention in the marketplace. But, and that's how all the frameworks are kind of built of, we start with the end in mind and reverse engineer. What do we need for the next step of the sales process? Before we can do outreach, we need a value proposition. Before we can build a value proposition, we need to understand who our buyers are, our ideal customer persona and the buyer's journey. Before we do that, we need to know what our own numbers are so we know what buyers do within the marketplace yeah. so the 15 and, frameworks and, all go hand in just, hand and, just on and that note of, of value proposition because i think sometimes uh we're very we're very kind of self-focused and we think okay this is what we think the value of this is and we think this is the value proposition and we but we don't we're not very good at really putting ourselves in the customer's shoes or the recipient and saying like well what would they really perceive as the value proposition so i think sometimes we get that backwards Absolutely. The problem is, it's not even the value proposition. It go, it's, it's a few steps even before that. Yeah, yeah. Most salespeople understand the product's features. We know that on, on Pipeline, this button does this thing. Mm-hmm. Then they can, they can articulate the benefit of that. This button does this thing, and it will help you save some time because it speeds up reporting. Yeah. But where everyone falls down is they don't go that extra step, which is what the buyer really cares about, which is the desire. So you've got an organizational desire and then you've got an individual desire. That individual wants reporting done quicker via Pipeliner because they've got three young kids and they come home from work late every day because they're faffing around with an archaic CRM (laughs) that everyone hates using, right? So we we don't we we won't know that until we get to the diagnosis call. That's very specific. We can make a bold hypothesis that this feature leads to this benefit, which leads to this desire, the desire being saving time, same resources, energy, whatever it is for the individual. And then we want to be able to articulate that in our value proposition of we help this person solve this problem this way. And we also then need a value proposition for the organization because we're not just selling typically to one individual. We're selling to yeah. you know, the higher up the food chain we go, the, the more the, the more the priorities of the organization will take hold. Mm-hmm. But but it's not rocket science. It's, 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 right. it's pretty simple. It's just a lack of time, energy, and effort from even from a leadership perspective, to start articulating some of this stuff down the food chain to the sales team, um, and then the sales team are the 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 ultimate feedback loop for right. this. Yeah, because they go into the market, they test it, they get the phone slammed down on the face, and they go, "Okay, maybe that isn't the bold hypothesis that is going to elicit a meeting here." Yeah, um, it's rinse and repeat over and over until we get it. Once we know what it is, then we just copy it over and over again, and we scale it. We build a bit of a playbook, and I'm not 
a fan of people using scripts word yeah, for yeah. word. Mm -hmm. No. Because it's not congruent, right? You have a different upbringing to me, obviously a different accent. You're based in a different location. You will say things one way. I will say things the other way. It might mean mm -hmm. the same. But what we want is a framework of start, middle, end, in between. These are probably uh, reasonable questions to ask. And that's how we build out, you know, the diagnosis call, the, the follow-up calls, everything else that comes alongside that. So that's how yeah. the, the frameworks are built up. No, um, no, no I, I, I agree completely with that. And I think, yeah, you're right about scripts is you have to make it your own because you have to have an authentic voice coming through. Uh, because if I'm just here like this going, hello, Will, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not authentic. I mean, I, I might as well, I might as well use AI for that now. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, and may, maybe that'll come. We, yep. You might still need a, an individual to program the AI. And humans might reject, I imagine, prospects for a certain period of time will not accept having a business conversation with an AI. But who mm -hmm. knows, 10 years from now, th th those um, what's accepted and what's not accepted in the marketplace very well could change. Yeah. So what's another framework that you want to dive into? So, so most impactful typically is really understanding your value proposition, because yep. then that's where your cold outreach is built upon. Uh, any follow-up can be built upon, hey, we agreed this meeting on the back of this. We can follow up on the back of that. Um, something else that I find that salespeople, when they wrap their head around it, has really quick and easy results is what I call micro-closing. So mm. this happens throughout the entirety of the sales process, happens obviously at the end of the process, and it can happen multiple times within a conversation as well. And essentially, all we're doing is three stages to it is, does it make sense to do this? Yes, it does. Okay, fantastic. You've closed the next step of the process. Mm -hmm. If the buyer says no, you go, okay. What open-ended question, what would it make sense to do? If they say, I'm not sure, then it's a close-ended question of, I've worked with people like you in the past. We've implemented this, our CRMs in many organizations of this size. Would it make sense to do this? So you narrow the focus. Mm -hmm. So that's the micro-close. Does it make sense to do this? Does it make sense for, if I send over the proposal tomorrow, if we jump on a call tomorrow afternoon and we run through it? Great, fantastic. And it's yeah. that over and over and over again. So that requires a level of awareness on behalf of the the seller, right? I mean, you should be looking, you know, measuring. It it almost reminds me, Will. I, I interviewed a guy a while back who does hundred uh, hundred mile ultra marathons, right? Mm -hmm. And you're like, how do you do it? I mean, how do you run a hundred miles seriously? And he said, you don't run a hundred miles. You run. You just set a goal in front of you. You're right. He, he said it could be the next bridge and make it to the next bridge and then you get to the bridge and then you say okay i'm naked and before you know it you're 100 miles in but i think salespeople, there's a good lesson there for being aware and looking for those small incremental as you say micro closes as you go and noting them and noting also when you're not getting them right yep yep and if you have a good rapport with the individual that you're engaging with and you suggest the next step and they reject that next step they will absolutely coach you on what that next step is. And you don't know until you've asked their internal buying process. Yeah. And so you need that coaching, especially with a complex, you know, you're selling a CRM. It's a complex, um, it's it, it's a complex sit sale because it might go to marketing, yeah. or uh, it might go to sales, it might go to CRO, it might go to an engineering team, mm -hmm. and there might be integrations. You have no idea, you can make a hypothesis, but you've no real idea of the buying process internally within that organization before you ask, hey, would it make sense to do this? And then you get the coaching on, no, what we need to do is this, this, and this. But fundamentally, what you're outlining there is exactly what the whole process that I, I preach is, is we split up the entirety of the buyer's journey. So not necessarily our sales process, or right. say what, what we want it to be, because we don't know what it is internally within the organization. For If you sell a used car, you can have a step-by-step -step sales process of get person in car, drive, tell them that they look great in car, bully them into closing deal. That's used car salesperson 101, right? Mm -hmm. For a complex sale, there's multiple stakeholders, much bigger deal sizes, much more nuance in working with different competitors and product offerings and all that kind of stuff. So what we need to do is really understand the buyer's journey. And it's going to go from, you know, we can go through the classic steps of awareness, non-awareness, awareness, and so on. But all we're trying to do is book that next meeting. So we have the diagnosis call, uh, a discovery call. I call it diagnosis call. It goes fantastic. The end of it, well, we've all things discussed here. You know, we've, we'll, we'll talk about pricing. We'll look at getting other people involved. Just at a high level, do you think it makes sense to move forward with this, you know, this quarter? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Then would it make sense to jump on a call with yourself and the financial decision maker next week to, to move this forward? 
No. Okay, well, what would it make sense to do? Oh, well, the financial decision maker is on holiday. Okay, well, great. Right. Fantastic. Let's jump on a call the week after. Yeah, fine, I'll set it up. And it's just that meeting after meeting after meeting. So there should never be an email being sent. I, I hate this. It, it kills me. <laughs> Every time I see one of our students in the program do this, they send a, a check-in email or a follow-up yeah, yeah, email. Yeah. There should never be an opportunity, you know, 99% of the time, um, unless there's been an absolute disaster or something ab absolutely unforeseen. You should never leave a meeting without the next step being in place and the next meeting essentially booked in. And that's yeah. where micro closing is really powerful. It allows yeah. you to be coached on the buyer's journey and essentially get get pulled along with it with the buyer. Yeah, and the other and the other important part of that is because this is uh, something that uh, you know used to frustrate me a lot though is is when it's one thing booking the next meeting, right? It's another thing. As you outlined there, you're booking the next meeting and saying, would it make sense of the CFO in, engaged? And they say yes. And so now you they're actually doing something actively. Like your contact is contacting the CFO, is saying, you know, we need to have this meeting. So they're actively doing something. If you just set up another meeting for two weeks with the same person to follow up, nothing has happened in between, right? There's no movement in that deal at all. It should always be an exchange of value. Yeah. You're sharing your time and expertise. They're going to bring the CFO in to legitimize the deal, to get their insights on it, to confirm budget. You should always, if, if I'm going to send a proposal, it's not, I'll email you the proposal. Let's connect sometime next week. It's yeah. if I send you the proposal today, would it make sense to jump on a call tomorrow morning, run through it and see if it's a good fit. It's always yeah. an exchange. And that's, again, that, you, you're spot on. People get that wrong of just having meetings yeah uh, meetings. well they, they used to be like you know the, the pre-covid days it was always like great one oh yeah i'm meeting them for lunch again next week and you're saying okay well what's happening in between well nothing and what are you discussing well we're, we're kind of talking about next steps or whatever so he said okay so basically right now we're just buying lunch for somebody yep <laughs> and do you know what maybe in yesteryear that would be a valuable sales tool Mm -hmm. It's beyond my kind of uh, career in sales, but I know working with in the medical device uh, world, you would take a surgeon away or you mm -hmm. take them for a get round of golf or you do this and that. You build big rapport with them. There are probably shady things going on behind the scenes that, you know, again, beyond, uh, previous to my time in the medical device space. Yeah. Um, but people just don't care for that anymore. They, no. They've got a problem. They want the problem solving. The, the, everyone is busy, even if it's, someone you think is a bit of an umpty and yeah. they shouldn't be in the role and you think they're a bit of an idiot, they're still overwhelmed. Yeah. Almost everyone is at every step in the corporate, um, you know, never mind getting into the world of sale uh, of startups if you're selling into that space. Sure. Everyone is absolutely overrun. And so all they want is the problem solving in a real simple, succinct way. Even if it's a complex product, we want to distill down what they're going to get out of it, the desire that's going to be fulfilled from them working with you. And as long as they can afford it, which typically in a larger organization isn't a problem, we can always find budget. Yeah. We can pull budget from one place or another. Uh, we can, as long as we can increase the urgency, the priority of our deal over someone else's, there's always going to be budget there. Then de deals will come in. Um, the yeah, the, the days of just having a coffee with someone, it, yeah. it should be over for salespeople because it's a terrible waste of their time, but it, it should is. be over for everyone else as well. It is. I know you're correct. And it's like people I always say, like, you know, people perceive themselves as being busier than they've ever been in their lives. I, I personally think they're more distracted than they've ever been in their lives. Yep. I think there's a difference between the two. But it's a reality is the fact that it, it, you have to be very transparent, succinct, and, and to the point. Uh, and, and I think that's what people that's what people want nowadays. They want that transparency. They want that authenticity. You know, they want they want to understand they want they want you to bring your expertise and to help them, but not, as you said, to to fluff, uh, to walk, go around the houses, to do all this kind of tactics and stuff. They really want, they really want kind of authenticity, I think. So what's, what's one last uh, piece of advice you'd like to share? One last piece of advice. Something that I wish I'd have done earlier in my career is set better habits. And that, I used to be a massive procrastinator. And I call individuals like like what I used to be sales nerds. There are loads mm -hmm. of sales nerds out there who know exactly what to do, but they don't implement it. Yeah. And just as a kind of to, to, to wrap up the, the idea of all these frameworks and, and the content that I produce and, and the book and the training I do, there's no point in knowing all that stuff if you're not the person who's capable of implementing it. Mm -hmm. If you're unassertive, 
then you're never going to ask the micro-closing questions that are going to pro progress the deal. If you've got terrible habits, you're going to self-sabotage every step of the process because you're going to be late to work, you're going to be scruffy, you, you're not going to be on time for meetings, and it doesn't matter how good you are in the meeting, it doesn't matter how charismatic you are and how charming you are, um, people aren't going to take you seriously because you showed up five minutes late. People aren't going to be there on the other end of the call because you showed up five minutes late. So something I wish I'd have done earlier on my career is really double down on, on habits and taking care of the things outside of sales like it's not not it's not sexy but mm -hmm. diet going to bed on time you know i don't have social media or email or anything like that on my phone as you mentioned distractions i don't have i, I try and remove as many distractions as i possibly can and then that ultimately means that my day is optimized because there's there's only the things i need to do in the day as opposed to all the other stuff that surrounds it that could surround it so yeah, so step one is understanding the process. Step two is becoming the person then that's capable of implementing it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic, fantastic advice. I mean, it is, I mean, you got to, it's all about the preparation. It's all about your, as you said, creating good habits. We're very, we're very good at creating bad habits, but you can create good habits just as easily if you put your mind to it. Uh, so great piece of advice. So listen, thanks, Will. All of Will's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So if you want to know more about me, if you've found interest in what we talked about thus far on this show, uh, just head over to salesman.com. You can grab both our books for free. There's a free community. I, basically, I give everything away for free, everything that I know. And you know, if you want to work with me and want help implementing it with implementing any of this, uh, we, we've got a couple of programs and uh, consulting that we do there as well. Yeah. And by the way, as Will told me earlier, the book is constantly being updated. So you're getting the latest, greatest and, and the most up to date information. So that's fantastic. So I'd encourage you to go check it out. It's uh, salesman.com. So listen, thanks again, Will. Thank you for watching, listening.